presentation, so if you hear a ring, it's because I will start to uh, wrap up. Um, the presentation will cover a number of aspects, so obviously I will not be able to cover all the elements, but um, as soon as the clock rings, I will move to the most fundamental parts of the presentation. So let me start with a parable, and it's a parable using football. Football that is played and is called soccer in some countries. Uh, keeping our goal clear and on focus. Football is quite interesting, particularly if we, we, we use the position of the goalkeeper. And the goalkeeper has a very important position in the team. He gives confidence, he keeps uh, everyone, he's the only one who has the total overview of the picture, of the pitch, uh, where everyone is positioned and where everyone is playing its best. If the goalkeeper is not focused and is not uh, on track and keeping his own goal clear, we might find ourselves in a situation like that, where the goalkeeper loses focus and we have a situation where we lose totally the focus and the goal to what we are playing for. So the goalkeeper is important in an organization and he keeps the team uh, in confidence, self-esteem and keeps everybody on track. If you look at another position, how important a goalkeeper is in the organization, he, he keeps the self-esteem and he mobilizes uh, the energy and team spirit particularly when he's extremely concerned with his goal and protecting his goal cost what cost. So the goalkeeper in an organization is very important because he moves the team. And the failure of the goalkeeper uh, in, a, in a pitch uh, is merciless for the public, for the crowd. Uh, you might, the crowd might accept the failure of one, but the goalkeeper cannot fail. So let's look at the achievements at the international level, what I call a framework for action. I would like to read that for you. In 1976, two treaties came into force in the international law that embody the highest ideals that have ever been expressed in law, let alone in international law. They are the covenant on civil political rights, and the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. The nations that have ratified these treaties, and that now includes the majority of nations on Earth, having so doing, surrendered a large measure of their sovereign powers over the populations of their countries, have committed themselves to making periodic reports to the United Nations on their progress. They have thus made themselves parties to the greatest collective project ever undertaken by our, by our species. The success of this project over the next century will depend in part on the removal of many obstacles. Some of these obstacles are entrenched political and economic interests, and some are ideas, attitudes, and habits of thought that are equally well entrenched. And some of these objectives, some of these uh, barriers we have uh, highlighted in our discussions here. Evictions, relocation, resettlement, denominations for an old phenomenon. I grew up with evictions in my own neighborhood in Rio. Those of you who have seen uh, the city of God, some of the people that lived next to me and went to school with me were evicted in the end of the 60s to create the city of God. And later on, when I was already a graduating student of architecture, I got involved with this quota movement in Brasilia, where the government had nationalized land. And very clear, it came very true to me and others who were involved in the movement, that land was crucial in the issue. And uh, we designed a, a book on those days to work together with the squatter movement to explain what were the issues at stake. So actually, despite the fact that land was nationalized and people had been come to the city to build the city, 
we saw that uh, the issue of land was crucial for the future of that particular city. And then yesterday and the day before, we have come to conclusion here that land is a fundamental variable in our equation. And I would never think that working Tanzania uh, a few months ago, I would find that illustration, a man living in a, on top of a tree, coming out every morning, going to work, but living on a tree. So when we engage with governments and we have a dialogue with government, I am quite surprised in my three years and a half in Habitat how little, how little and how confusing policy makers and activists and NGO uh, directors, uh, academics have about what is the notion, how do we understand houses. I hear many definitions, houses, uh, shelter, and but the understanding of the sector as a whole and the interlinkage and the importance of policies, for me, surprisingly, is not there. And there is a lot for us to work on this. When we talk about housing with people out there in our dialogues with governments and institutions, we're speaking about something much more than houses or flats or an individual shelter. We're talking about an economic sector that has interlinkage with very fundamental inputs where there is a governance system regulated by institutions and laws and, and regulations. And it is our important and our role to understand this and unfold the interlinkage and the bottlenecks in order to design our different instruments, policies, and actions. We know very well that when there is a scarcity of one of these elements, or if you wish, if one of these individuals leave this equilibrium of this coverage, of this shelter, of this roof, something will fall or will fall in this equilibrium. And it's the same when we look there. Policy makes a difference, understanding this interlinkage, because when the scarcity of one element will be total disequilibrium of that, and then we see in our cities uh, people moving to uh, overcome the limitation or the scarcity of one of these elements. So housing policy interventions are really needed, and that is what we advocate. Because in the end of the day, what our ultimate goal is enable access to affordable and adequate housing for all, and making clear that there is an interlinkage of policy interventions and government action and other actors in this very complex network. We also know that there is a market, and we need to understand the market, what influence supply, what is influence demand, and this is our uh, area of capacity building and educating individuals that are taking very important decisions. What, what we are important is the outcome, and many of you said that the outcome is very important. The process is fundamental, but the outcome as well. And going back to the uh, human rights language that so much came um, in our discussion, the outcome is quite important. So the progressive realization of the right to adequate housing, it is a choice. And when we engage with government, we remind them what we mean by adequate housing. There are international uh, instruments, there are agreements that governments have on the side, and the issue of security of tenure is quite important, and the protection from forced eviction. We remind over and over when we are in dialogue with government that this is what we mean when we talk about adequate housing. We also seem to, to forget when we engage more in an advocacy about the general comment seven that outlined very well, and, and Milun came, and many of you also outlined, uh, the general UN guideline, if evictions have to take place, the due process, etc., etc. But there are moments where evictions are carried out by force in accordance with the law and in conformity with the provisions of the International Covenant on Human Rights. And we've seen over and over that planning decisions, rules, etc., uh, are in, in the let's say, the deep-rooted cause of some of these forced evictions. And we need to be aware of that to see where is the borderline where our actions are necessary. So observations for the way forward one. There is much disparity about the notion of housing amongst all stakeholders. Government officials, practitioners, NGO staff have inadequate exposure to and consequently limited knowledge about the array of housing policy experience that there is around the world. 
there is a lot of anecdotal-based policy decision making, and we are advocating that we need to have evidence-based policies implemented and designed. And we also argue that there is a training capacity building, as well as the need for policy dialogues, including South-South cooperation, which are highly needed. So the mandate, our mandate, many of you said how important the uh, habitat agenda are and how strongly embedded the human rights principles are there. And I would agree fully with you. And we remind over and over about these elements of the uh, habitat agenda that are, it was a, a subject of a lot of negotiations and many of you were present as part of the partners from the civil society groups participating there. So the observation there is that the role of UN Habitat is to hold countries accountable and call upon their commitments and obligations, advise and recommend. Many believe that the implementation of the Habitat Agenda is UN Habitat's responsibility. I don't think so. I think civil society organizations, Habitat Agenda partners, are equally responsible for its implementation through working closely with or pressing their own governments to implement the contents of the Habitat Agenda, amongst other things. Uh, habitat alone cannot move this agenda, no way. That's my personal view. So we see some trends, and I think uh, some colleagues argue that uh, the definition of slums follow very much the discussion they had before my time here, which is based on UN Habitat's right-based definition, claiming that every individual in a city has the right to have access to drinking water, sanitation, uh, adequate housing in terms of durability, sufficient space, and obviously secure tenure. And we see over and over in major cities the process of informality taking over. And we see some trends. And the trend is that the process will increase. And you see in the, in the developed nations, uh, econ uh, cities shrinking. But on the other hand, half of the cities in the developing world in rapid or accelerated growth process. We see that mapping, Habitat has been do doing a lot of mapping where these processes are taking place. And this is the bad and the good news. The good news is that the huge investments the governments are doing in terms of provision of housing, I will not go about the merits of these policies, but rather that the quantity have been made possible for decreasing the percentage of population living uh, the urban public living in slums, as you see in the green line. The bad news is that the, in absolute numbers, the numbers are increasing and they will continue to increase. And this is what our data is suggesting. And we see in some regions, uh, urbanization practically be a synonym of informal urbanization, informal settlements, informal land development. So cities are growing on the basis of social political process and land development process that are totally out of the planning framework. So observations that getting the right data and unfolding the policy implications are some of the fundamental monitoring roles of UN Habitat. Unfolding the implications and disseminating experience in addressing the problem is another critical role for UN Habitat. Supporting government, civil society and partners in developing evidence-based policies and responses are also critical roles for UN Habitat. Obviously, that because you're here, and you're not here just by coincidence, that we believe you have a role to play too. So I want to show you Nairobi and remind you about Nairobi and the situation. And I want to ask you, who in this room knows what's the population of Kibera, the total population of Kibera? Have you read, have you heard? Is there anybody who can tell? Yes? Just about 200,000. Exactly. Exactly. How many of you have read the largest slum of Africa? 800,000 people, 600,000 people. I read even a million people. What's the credibility if an organization or individuals, professionals start saying we have the largest slum in Africa and we have almost one million people living there. I think this, is, this, this puts at stake the credibility of organizations. The numbers about Kibera kept being inflated and became conventional wisdom 
spread by the press, local actors, government, UN inhabitant, international organizations. Conventional wisdom is often wrong, leading to fabrication of facts and process. This has serious implications for the credibility of any organization, individual, BUN Habitat, and all NGOs working in this field who embrace the lie. So we need to be careful about the numbers. And I will recall Port Harcourt, where many or some of you were sending around messages claiming that there were 800,000 people being evicted in a city that has 1.2 million inhabitants. And we, we were saying, guys, get real. These are not the numbers. We're going, we went to the field. We're looking at. So you have responsibility. When you spread the news that the, the numbers are there, we lose our credibility and we lose our argument. We need to be very clear, very critical about the numbers. Numbers of eviction, numbers of people that are being affected. We cannot play with these numbers because otherwise it shoots back on us. So this is an important lesson, I believe, for those working in evictions. So I need to wrap up. And uh, I go to where I believe um, is uh, the way we're working forward in some of these issues. Uh, you know very well that uh, we, ca we came a long way from 76, where slums were recognized. There was a belief that self-help housing would uh, help to solve the problems that we were observing in many cities. Uh, in 87, we had the International Year of Homeless Housing and Shelter were really put on the international agenda. Then we had, a year later, the global... Uh, sorry, something happened. So um, we, you have the global shelter strategy for the year 2000, and the enabling strategies uh, were formulated, translated in the retreat of governments from the housing sector. Then in 96, we had the Istanbul uh, conference, shelter for all advocacy, and the recognition of the right to adequate housing. The year 2000, the Millennium Declaration, the Millennium Summit, and slum and poverty put on the international agenda and the MDGs. So we saw very well that we moved from housing without houses, government supply to market supply, and in 2003, UN Habitat made a study on slum and said this failed completely. So the question is, where are we going from here to 2025? And I argue that that would be a strong movement, and I hope it will be realized, that will be more and more on the right-based approach development. But we also have under other elements, the cities and climate change, sustainable urbanization, sustainable urban development that came from 92 conference. So from our point of view, we have a particular process internally on defining our strategic plan, uh, which is called the MTSIP, and within the, the focal area three, which is access to housing and land for all, we developed a, a housing program which address particular components, among them the security of tenure, and there is a particular element which is the global housing strategy. So to come to, to the point where we want to move, there is a process which is ongoing, has started with the last uh, governing council. We started the global, the global urban campaign. We have two World, world Urban Forums uh, coming up. We have the Rio Plus conference, and we have the Habitat 3 conference in 2016. Our understanding is that we need to move and use your constituents to create national urban forum, to create a momentum in cities and, and countries where the urban issues and the urban agenda can be put on the forefront of the political discussion. We are aware that we got the resolution, we got the political backing to start a number of activities. First, to review the process of the previous global strategy and formulate a new global housing strategy to the year 2025, which hopefully can be presented with a number of elements and principles and recommendations to the General Assembly. This means that uh, we need to do a lot of things. We're doing some of this, and I think the work you're doing and other organizations are doing will bring a lot of information and experiences and practice, which will help us to enhance our knowledge of what is going on in the field of housing, uh, what is going on within, in cities regarding the right to adequate housing, and how this 
new movement that we can start with the global strategy, can start bringing a new paradigm in policy thinking and practice. So we need to think about how these, what kind of outcomes this can have at the national, international and local level. So it could be that this could provide an interesting framework for us to do our advocacy, to do our policy work, etc., etc. So in the way we are addressing this is uh, there are three components. Uh, the EGM is part of this component two, the global eviction and monitoring prevention. We have done a lot of dialogues with some of the organizations sitting around the table, and we felt that this was the moment to really, um, uh, let's say, um, look at these components, how this integrates in the overall planning and priorities that are being put forward, and how we can move uh, this, uh, this agenda forward, integrated into the overall strategic planning and strategic vision of UN Habitat. Our first thought was that we know there are many actors, we just list a few of them. We had the advisory group, we thought that the way the group was functioning, the way the, 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 the outcome of the group was integrated was not really adequate and uh, some of the discussions here confirmed that. So we thought that the AGFIM uh, as a group could be transformed into something much broader and much more participatory, including the institutions that are here and other individuals and institutions that are not here. We would take into consideration our programs, the Office of High Commission on Human Rights, the Special Rapporteur, and create some kind of um, um, facility or some kind of element that would enable us to have the numbers right, to have the topology and typology of evictions right, and create a, a broader knowledge on how to promote um, alternatives to eviction and how to prevent monitor, and even, as, as Leticia suggested, some kind of warnings where things are getting really critical and where uh, some actions or advice or missions could take place. And we believe that a lot of knowledge, a lot of um, tools, a lot of uh, networking could result of these uh, ideas. Now, uh, I end here with this photo, and he won a prize in Brazil in a public campaign. And um, it was a public campaign that was embedded in many things, including the right to the city. And he rightly said that public neglect is such that one does not even notice that the picture is upside down. And uh, that was really um, a winning campaign. That, so thank you.